Do you have a PowerPoint? There you go. Thank you. Okay. Well, we want to welcome each and every one of you to our Bible class this morning, where we're going to continue our study in the book of Acts. If you're joining us in person or online, we want to thank you for your time. We're going to be in Acts chapter 22. We have finished chapter 21, and uh, we, got, we finished the first 16 verses of chapter 22 on uh, Wednesday night. But before we begin, uh, I just want to remind you that uh, on Wednesday night, we'll be beginning in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and Rob will be teaching that, uh, that series on the uh, uh, prison epistles on Wednesday night. Okay, so let me just remind us, right, that what we're looking at in Acts is the spread of the gospel. And it is according to the way that Jesus outlined for his disciples. He said, when the Holy Spirit descends upon you, you will have power to be my witnesses. Beginning where? In Jerusalem, and then in Judea, and then in Samaria, and then in the rest of the world. And if you were to pick out a theme for the book of Acts, it would be the spread of the gospel, which is in parallel to the growth of the church, right? From Jerusalem to where? Where does it end? Jerusalem to Rome. That's right. To the cent- from the center to the center of the world, the belly of the beast. And this is where we're going to end in chapter 28 of the book of Acts. And so let me just take us back a little bit and review for us. But before we do that, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Almighty God in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to gather here and to study your word. Help us, Father, Guide us in this study so that every word that we express, our thoughts, will be for the edification of each and every one. Be with us, Father, throughout this study, and thank you for your Son, our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so the Apostle Paul, on the advice of the church leadership, went with the four men that had taken a vow, and it is likely the Nazarite vow. He is to pay their expenses, and he is to demonstrate that he had respect for the customs of the Jews, because his reputation in the city of Jerusalem was bad. They thought that he was teaching against the Gentiles obeying the uh, law. He was teaching the Jews of not obeying the law, and not circumcising their children. And so, according to the leadership in Jerusalem, they said, we want you to show that you have respect for the customs so that you can reach the Jews. Now, before he came to Jerusalem, he has expressed some very, very heavy and profound thoughts. And here's what he said in Romans chapter 9, verse 2. He said, I have, this sadness that is perpetual in my heart. I wish that if I could wish, I would wish that I were accursed and be cut off from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my own kinsmen of the flesh. Now, that's a very profound and that's a very strong statement, right? Because he's saying, listen, if I were to wish, I would wish that I were lost in order for the sake of my fellow kinsmen of the flesh to obey the gospel. There were two reasons why he was really pressed to get to the city of Jerusalem. And one was to bring the offering that was made from the Uh, Gentile churches in Macedonia and Achaia. And then the second one was, 
He needed to be there on the day of Pentecost where the Jews will make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem so that he could preach the gospel to them. He wanted to do that. And so here is his opportunity, right? But when he went into the uh, uh, temple with the four men to announce the end of the Nazarite vow, he was accused by the Jews that had yeah, battled with him in the first, uh, uh, during his first journey in uh, Asia. And he was accused of preaching against the Jews, preaching against the law of Moses, preaching against the temple, but the fourth one was the most serious one, and that charge was that he had brought in Trophimus, the Gentile, into the temple, and that's a no-no. So they grabbed him, took him out, closed the doors, and were ready to kill him. Now, from the fortress of Antonia, the tribune led 1,000 soldiers and their job was to observe the activities that went on below. And their job was to make sure that there was no riot on any of the festival days of the Jews. Because Rome frowned upon any riots that happened. And so when the tribune and his soldiers saw that, they ran down immediately and they rescued the Apostle Paul. Now, in the effort of rescuing the Apostle Paul, he asked the following. What's the charge? Yeah, why is everybody so mad and they want to tear this guy apart? But nobody said what the charge was. They were all screaming different things. And so he took the Apostle Paul with the soldiers and they began to march him up the steps. And they couldn't, he couldn't march because the Jews were trying to tear him apart. And so the soldiers picked him up and they carried him up the steps. The Apostle Paul asked, if he could speak, and they gave him permission. And in chapter 22, this is his defense, and we're going to continue. And what we covered so far is this. In his defense, he told him about his life before his conversion. And he said, I was just like you. I was zealous for the law. I persecuted the believers in the Lord. Just like you. I studied it. I knew it. Just like you. And he said, but on the way to Damascus, the Lord appeared to him. And he went into the city of Damascus as he was directed by the Lord. And he was baptized for the remission of his sins. Now, let me back up just a little bit. Each and every one of us, especially those of us that came out of denominationalism, we have our own testimonial right? Our own stories. And we can articulate that verbatim. I was converted about 48 years ago, and I can tell you verbatim my story. This is what the Apostle Paul is doing. At the top of the steps, he held up his hand. The Jews began very quiet. And then he began to speak to them in Hebrews, and they became even more quiet. And he began his testimonial, all right? He got to the point where we're going to begin in chapter 17. And again, remember, he's standing on top of the steps, and he is telling them about his experience. In verse uh, 17 of chapter 22, Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance. Now, uh, let's... Uh, uh, Kind of back up a little bit. After he obeyed the gospel, the apostle Paul said this. He didn't consult with anybody. He didn't go up to Jerusalem and be with the apostles. But he went where? Arabia. For three years, and then he returned to Damascus. And then he went up to Jerusalem, and this is where we are right now. So he said he was in the temple, and he was in a trance. And saw him saying, verse 18, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. Now, imagine the shock of the Apostle Paul, right? I mean, he's one of them. And he's going to make an argument. And the disappointment he must have felt. Yeah, the Lord told him, 
hurry and get out of here because they won't listen to what you say about me. And now the Apostle Paul is trying to make an argument as to why they might listen to him. Listen to what he's saying. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I am prison and beat those who believe on you. He's making a confession, right? This is what I used to do, and they saw me, that I used to put believers in you in prison, and I used to beat them. Verse 20, and when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. And he said, he went further, right? He said, when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I was there giving my approval. And my job was to watch over the clothes of those that were stoning him, killing him. And I was there giving my approval. And then, verse 21, then he said to me, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Now, imagine, there are two captive audiences. The Jews were all captivated. They were very quiet. They were listening to him, hanging on to every word. The other audience are the Romans. Now, I don't know how many of them spoke Hebrew because the Apostle Paul was speaking or giving his testimony in in the uh, Hebrew language. I don't know how many understood Hebrews, right? But I can tell you, if Keith were to give his testimonial about his conversion to the Lord, even if I didn't understand English and I'm watching him giving that testimonial, I'm going to realize that this guy really believes in what he's saying. Yeah, it has depth and it has dimension and his body language is, he's getting embedded in that story. And the Romans, even if they didn't understand the language, they knew that this guy really believed in what he said. And then all of a sudden, he mentioned a word. And everybody went ballistic. And you can imagine the Romans who are probably asking, what, the, what happened? What happened? And those that understood Hebrew, they probably say, well, he mentioned something. And he mentioned Gentiles. That's us. And now they're going crazy. Let's move on to the next one in verse 18, uh, uh, verse 22. All right. Let me stop. Anybody has any comments before we continue? Let's continue this talk because this is very important. Up to this word, what word? Gentiles, right? We need to just mention a few things about this. We read some quotes by prominent Jews, right, who make the following statement, that God created the Gentiles to kindle the fire of where? Hell. That's really what they believe. They have no use for them, that the only reason why God created them was to kindle the fires of hell. Now, we know the story about the first century, right? The Jews live in Judea, and they live in Galilee, but they were separated by Samaria. And how did they treat the Samaritans? Oh, like dogs. Did they journey, if somebody was to go from Judea to Galilee, would he cross into Samaria? Oh, no. They go around. They go the long way. They would go up to the border, right? Before they cross into Samaria, they go across the Jordan to the eastern shore, and then they go up, and then they cross over into Galilee. They did not want to get defiled by the ground where the Samaritans were. Who was the one that broke that tradition and went through Samaria? Jesus. Yeah, because he had the divine appointment. And he met that woman at Jacob's well. He went through and he came back to Samaria. But the other Jews, they wouldn't do it. Yeah, it's way beneath them to do that. And now, 
Paul dared to say that Jesus was sending him far away to the Gentiles, and they just went ballistic upon that statement. Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. In other words, get rid of this guy from the earth. He's not fit to live. Right? Just because of his attitude, what he said about the Gentiles. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust in the air, the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying, he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. Now, what is the sign? When the Jews were angry, they took off their outer garments, threw it on the ground, right? And they reached down and filled their hands with dust, and they threw it in the air. What was that a sign of? Happiness? Yeah, contempt, disgust. What did they want to do that they couldn't do at this sign? What, what, what is that a sign of? When you take off your outer garment, you're getting ready to do what? They want to kill him. How, Rob? Stone him. That's what they did with Stephen, right? And normally when you stone somebody, you take off your outer garment so that you can be free to throw like a pitcher, right? And that's what they were doing. They couldn't throw rocks, and so they threw dust in the air. Now, the captain of the army said, now, let's take him, take him into the barracks, and we're going to exact a confession from him by flogging him. Now, imagine if you were in the position of the tribune, the captain. When you asked, nobody gave you what the charge was. Strike number one. Right? When the Apostle Paul gave his testimonial on top of the stairs, you're hoping, as a captain, that he's going to say what the charge was. He didn't. Now he's probably thinking, i got to accept a confession to find out what the charge is. Why is it that they are so angry with this man? I'm going to do my best to get the confession out of him. So they brought him into the uh, barracks and prepare him for flogging. Now, let me just take a sidebar right here. I know we don't have a whole lot of time. I'm taking too many sidebars, but I'm going to take one right here. Whose footsteps is the Apostle Paul following right here? Jesus. He's walking the footsteps of Jesus. Jesus. That's it. Same place that our Lord and Savior was, right? You know, Sometimes when we say, wow, I've been mistreated, check, he's been mistreated, right? When you say, my friends have turned my back, their backs on me, check, his own family, months before, didn't believe in him, right? Oh, I'm not accepted in my town, check, an entire country rejected him. The nation of Israel rejected him. Yeah, there is absolutely nothing, and I know I use ah, big statements sometimes. Uh, and it's been a while, but I'm going to use this as an example. There were two individuals that had a dispute. And I was there in the center uh, to kind of mediate between these two ladies. And I said, well, I tell you what, let's just go ahead and apologize. We'll say a prayer, and then we move forward. And here's what one of them said. You don't know what she has done to me. I didn't say anything. But deep down, here's what I was thinking. You're right, I don't. But I know she didn't slap you in the face. I know she didn't spit on you. I know she didn't flog you. 
I know she didn't crucify you. I know she didn't reject you, right? I don't care what it is. I mean, I do care. Whatever the issue that you have is, he already blazed the, the trail for you. Already there. Check our high priest. He was there. And so there's absolutely nothing in this world we can say, well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really giving up too much for the Lord. No, no, no. Not even close. He's gave up a whole lot more than any one of us can. So, uh, here, the Apostle Paul is coming along in the footsteps of our Lord. This is what they did to him. So, in fogging, they would take off your upper garment, and they will strap you down on a post and fasten your hands with thongs, leather with thongs, and then they expose that service area that they're going to hit. Look at what we have right here. This is a, oh, I'm sorry. I've been talking and I'm looking at my slides and I assume that you all have the same slide. Okay. This is where we are. All right. This is a whip. It's called the flagellum. This is what they use to flog people. Now, flogging was invented by the Egyptian, but it was perfected to an art form by the Romans. It's a form of punishment, right? You have to whip straps of leathers. Each one has alternating steel ball and very sharp brass, pieces of brass, on every one of those strands. So here's what they would do. They strap the individual to be flogged down to a post, exposing their back, and then two soldiers, one on each side, they would take turn by hitting the back. Steel ball will make contusions in the skin, and the brass will tear and shred that skin, beginning with the skin to the muscles until you can see through the physera. From there. It is a horrible way of punishing somebody. Now, we, I don't think that the Apostle Paul was going to be whipped this bad, right? Because he wasn't going to be crucified. But I can tell you this I don't care how many lashes he received, one is enough rest, right? Yeah, you get scars for life on your back, and they're getting ready to do just that. And the Roman priests even force had special dispensation to use whatever they thought was necessary. Yes. Against the Jews. They didn't know. They didn't expect. That's right. Yeah, that they didn't expect. But they stretch, they had stretched him out for the whips. Paul said to the centurion who was standing by. Is it lawful for you to flog a man who's a Roman citizen and uncondemned? Now, here's a problem, right? They were mistreating this guy, thinking that he was a Jew. And they were right. He was a Jew, right? But he's very unusual because he had dual citizenship. I mean, the Apostle Paul was probably the perfect tool for the Lord to bear the gospel before the Gentiles and before the Jews and before the kings like the Lord had promised to him in Acts chapter 9, right? And so he said, is it lawful to flog someone that is a Roman citizen who had not been condemned? And so now the centurion ran to the tribune. This is a serious Thing that he just found out, right? And so, what are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. Oh, this is serious business. And so, uh, the tribune ran, and he asked the only question that he could ask, and he said, are you a Roman citizen? If you lie, 
with the answer, you said you were, and you were not a Roman citizen, you lose your life in a problem. See, he was bright enough to say, all right, we got to cover ourselves, because obviously we're in trouble. And so he said, I got to ask him the only question, and that is, are you a Roman citizen? Without hesitation, the Apostle Paul said, yes, I am. Let's back up just a little bit. What is the problem here? Well, there are two, right? If you were a Roman citizen, it's sort of like the United States. You are endowed with inalienable rights. And the Roman government takes the rights very seriously. And that is that you are not to bind somebody without due process. Check number one. They violated that, right? He's been bound already. Number two. Flogging was reserved for foreigners and everybody else but Roman citizens. They're getting ready to violate that. And now all of a sudden, when the Apostle Paul said, I am a, citizen, I'm, I, I'm a Roman citizen, now fear came upon everybody. We're in trouble. If Rome finds out that we violated the rights of a Roman citizen, we are in trouble. And so, the tribune answered. Here's what he said. In verse 28, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. Paul said, I am a citizen by birth. Incredible, right? Yeah. He trumped the uh, citizenship of this uh, tribune. Now, there are four ways that one can get a, a Roman citizenship. And it may, very, it may be very similar to the way that somebody can get a citizenship of the United States. Maybe not quite. Number one, you have to be born a citizen. You know, my children, I don't know if I call it a privilege, but they don't realize it, but they have dual citizenship, right? By birth, they are U.S. citizens. By birth, 50% of them, they are citizens of the Federated States of Micronesia. They don't have the passport. All they have to do is pay their $20 and they get the passport. Okay? By birth. Number two. In the whole Roman Empire. Exactly. Only the Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's very. Yeah, he had it. Very similar. That's right. And the second one is military service. But this one is long. If you're a foreigner and you serve in the Roman army, uh, you don't get your citizenship until you retire, which may take 20 to 25 years based on your commitment, and you'll get a citizenship. Number three, emancipation of a slave. And that is, if you were once a slave and you're free as a reward, they give you citizenship. And here's the fourth one, which I think applies to the tribune. And that is, you cannot purchase Roman citizenship. Sort of, okay? But he said, hey, I bought mine with a lot of money, with a great sum. Well, I think what he meant was this. Citizenship could be bestowed upon you by somebody higher up in the Roman government as a favor for you rendering very good service and usually get favors of those under the head, right? And favors usually come to the form of money. That's it. There are countries in the world that if you pay 500000 to a million dollars, you get your citizenship immediately. But here, as a favor. Now, uh, the tribune's name we're going to find out in the next chapter is Claudius. Claudius is from the emperor, right? So it is likely that he assumed the name of the one that bestowed a favor upon him, and that is the emperor. So it could be that he paid a lot of money as favors to those under Claudius, and then Claudius signed off on his citizenship. And his uh, Gentile name is Lysias. Let's continue. Verse 29. So those who were about to examine him 
withdrew some, from him immediately. And the tribune was also afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. They were scared. They were afraid. They realized that they had done wrong. Right? Now, how can Lysias or the tribune recover? This guy is no slouch. And let's go to the next verse, verse number 30. I put in an uh, image right here because it's pertinent to uh, verse 30. But on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet, and he brought Paul down and set him before them. All right. Here's what Lysias decided to do, right? He's failed to accept a confession from the Apostle Paul twice, and now he wanted to come up with a foolproof way of accepting confession as to what the charge was, and it failed, right? Now he's going on to fourth attempt, and that is now, I'm going to put him before the Sanhedrin, right? This is the... Uh, image of the temple is a model of the temple. And you can see that the temple is actually going from east to west. When the sun rises, it hits the opening of the holy place, right? And so on the north wall is what's called a chamber of hewn stone. And this is, you can see that reddish on the north wall. This is the chamber of hewn stone. This is where the Sanhedrin meets, okay? Sanhedrin is made up of about 70 individuals plus the chair, sort of, and the chair is the reigning high priest at that time, okay? And uh, let me go to the next one. I apologize for the small figure, but usually they sit 35 on each side in semicircle. High priest sits up here. And then you have two clerks to take notes. And then the accused is standing before them to face and to defend himself. Okay? Now, I have looked at this over the years. Not sure about this. Uh, did they meet in the chamber of hewn stone? I'm not sure. Or did they meet, since this is an emergency meeting, did he just give them a room for them to sit? and meet in. If they met in a chamber of hewn stone, Gentiles were not allowed to go there. But it appears that the captain and the soldiers were free to come and go to get the Apostle Paul from uh, the Sanhedrin. So it could be that they were meeting in the official meeting of the place. Now, you remember that the official meeting place is not very far from the fortress of Antonia, which is the northwest corner right here. So they would have released him and go here if that's where they uh, met. But it's likely that they met somewhere else because the uh, uh, Gentiles were free to come and go. Uh, but let's see in verse 30. But on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet and he brought Paul down and set him before them. Now let's go to round number four. Okay? Chapter 23. We're going through very quickly. Chapter 23. Now, uh, the Apostle Paul came before the Sanhedrin. And in verse one, and looking intently at the council. You can imagine what the Apostle Paul is thinking, right? He has failed twice already, right? And here, he has a, uh, he's failed once. Now he has another chance to meet with the brethren. And he looked at them intently. You can imagine what he was probably thinking. My brethren, my own flesh and blood. And he said, brothers... I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. Now, if you were to follow 
the writings of the Apostle Paul, you would notice that talking about his conscience was something that he enjoyed talking about. He wasn't bragging, right? But he did talk about uh, 40, uh, not 40, 23 times he talked about his conscience in his writing. So here's what he said. Brothers, I have lived my life in all good conscience up to this day. Now, is the Apostle Paul saying that he was sinless? What, what did he mean by in all good conscience? He had followed the law very carefully. Yes, check off all the boxes. And as Nancy said, whatever he thought was right, he would do. Never went against his conscience, right? In, uh, I believe, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, I believe that's where it is. He said, I know of nothing against me. But that doesn't justify me. The judge... It's the Lord. Yes, Carmen? And he has said he has not been with condemnation, no charges, formally. Yes. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, so, so his conscience is clear, right? And if he made a mistake, what do you think he did? He would correct that immediately, and it's shown right here. Right? But I want to go back to the way that he addressed the Sanhedrin. Normally, when you address the Sanhedrin, you, the proper way of addressing them is rulers of the people and elders of Israel. Look at the way that the apostles in Acts chapter 4 addressed the Sanhedrin when they were accused and brought before the Sanhedrin. They said, elders and fathers, Stephen in Acts chapter 7 said the following, brothers and fathers. It's very, very formal, very respectful. But here, the Apostle Paul, some of your translation might say, men and brethren. Why is he using a very informal way of addressing this? What is he doing here? Commonality. Pardon me? That core commonality. Yeah, he's bringing himself and the members of the Sanhedrin on equal footing, right? And it is very likely that a lot of these men were his classmates, right? They had learned the law, uh, especially the Pharisees. They grew up together. They learned together. He probably knew some of them. And he's making it very informal and bring everybody on the same level and address them as brothers, men and brethren. But when he said that, that he had lived in all good conscience up to this day, the high priest Ananias. Now, this Ananias name is very common, right? We learn about it, Ananias, it was in chapter 5 uh, of Acts, and Ananias was married to Sapphira, right? And then in the city of Damascus, there was a Ananias that baptized the apostle Paul, right? And then Let's not confuse it with the high priest, right? The retired high priest during the time of our Lord and Savior, over 20 years before that. His name was what? Annas, not Ananias, Annas. His son-in-law was the reigning high priest by the name of Caiaphas. Yeah, Jesus was brought before both of them. They went to Annas as a formality, and then they were tried before the Sanhedrin that was uh, 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 led by the high priest gave us. So this is a different one. Ananias went or be, uh, was appointed to power in 47 AD, about the same time that the Apostle Paul began uh, the, his missionary journey. Right? And then they struck him on the mouth in verse 3. Then Boaz said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet, contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? What's going on here? 
He's calling out their hypocrisy. Pardon me? He's calling out their hypocrisy. Yes. Yeah, he, he, here are men, right? 35 on each side, the high priest and then the clerk. Here are men that should adjudicate matters, right? According to the law of Moses. They knew it. They should respect it. And yet, when Annas or Ananias commands somebody to strike him on the mouth, he violated the law of Moses, right? Here's what Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 1 and 2 said. If there's a dispute between individuals, you bring those individuals to be judged. And once they're judged, to justify, the innocent one will be justified, and the guilty one will receive beating that is appropriate for that, right? And so he has violated that law. He? Well, this, this is another example of how far they had fallen from the law. Okay. That they had gotten so wrapped up in their traditions, they had ignored the law. We see the same thing with Jesus and the woman caught in adultery. They violated the law's protocol with the woman in adultery by bringing her to Jesus and not bringing the man. Both people involved in that act are supposed to be brought before the high priest to make judgment about them. And this is just another example of how they were above that. They, they had gotten away with it with Jesus, and they're trying to get away with it again through the call. Yes. Thank you. David? More specifically about striking, this is direct with those who are standing in judgment of others, which they were doing. Uh-huh. But it's 1915, which is crossroads. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor and burden the great, but in righteousness you shall judge your name. Uh-huh. So he was in direct violation of the own political law of judgment. But this is a very strong statement, right? Yeah. Jesus used statement very similar to that to the Pharisees, right? Yeah. You whitewash tombs, sepulchre. Yeah. Ezekiel used very similar statement against the false teachers of his time. Okay? But this came out. And this kind of surprised me about the Apostle Paul, right? And look at it another way. And somebody has said this. I'll get to you, Renee. Somebody has said this. It could be a prophetic message that the Apostle Paul is speaking, right? Because this Ananias was a really corrupt high priest. Well, was anybody not corrupt corrupt that were high priests? But this one was very notorious of being corrupt. He used to use the tithes for the temple that was meant for the ordinary priest, and he used to steal it for his own good. Right? He used to align himself with Rome, and during the Jewish-Roman conflict, he was killed, not by the Romans, but by his own people, the Jews. That's how much they hated this high priest. Renee. I'll because give you. the Holy Spirit is going to tell you what to say. Yeah. So he's guided by the Holy Spirit here. Yeah, this is a prophetic message, right? I, I mean, it came true. Yeah, but the way he stated it was, was very strong. Uh, now, in uh, Exodus chapter uh, uh, 22, verse 28, uh, here's what the law said. You shall not revile God nor curse a ruler of your people. Yeah, so both the Apostle Paul and Ananias were sort of guilty of doing something. Here's what they don't understand. The high priest was supposed to be chosen from the family of Aaron. And that was true up until about 400 B.C. 
And at that time, it started being that political patronage job. Yeah. You paid money. Your money got you the position and not your heritage like it's supposed to be. So this man was not a true high priest even. Yeah. The yeah. Romans established the high priest because that was the way it controlled people. Yeah. And put their people in that. Yes. So maybe he overspoke. But if this isn't a true high priest, yeah. it's not long. Very interesting. So what Brez is saying is, and that is correct that it used to be there's a lineage of high priests from the lineage of Aaron, right? But then what happened is later on, it was political appointment. Yeah, it was, it was for political reasons that they were appointed. Uh, and I see folks coming out. We're just getting into the story. And so we're going to uh, stop right there and we'll pick up next Sunday. Yeah. Exodus uh, 23, verse 28, 22, verse 28.